papers grade how are you doing when we left off at gooseberry park there had been a big ice storm remember and when we left off stumpy had heard a really long a really loud crack and went falling 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 well the next chapter is chapter eight a very big when evening descended and the ice storm had stopped, the professor still slept while Kona kept the vigil at the window, trembling as great pines bent their icy heads to the ground and jumping at the sharp sounds of thick bark breaking. All of the lights in the neighborhood were out. The refrigerator didn't hum, the plant light didn't buzz, and the warm furnace air didn't hush to the vents. Professor Albert's fireplace and the gas post lamp in the front yard were the only sources of light and they cast a funeral glow upon the house and its occupants, stranded like polar bears on an arctic floor. What are we going to do, Gwendolyn? Kona asked, his big head casting a giant shadow over her bowl. Stumpy is in serious trouble. Yes, Gwendolyn said, nodding. It's serious, very serious. Even if her tree is still standing, she'll be trapped in her nest in the ice. The babies. I have to help her, Kona said, pacing in her in circles around the living room. Kona dear, what can you do? She's at the top of a tall tree. There would be no way of reaching her, and the journey to the park. Treacherous, very treacherous indeed. The ice is difficult, nearly impossible to cross, as poor Mr. Poor Professor Albert demonstrated earlier. Trees are coming down, heavy branches dropping from great heights. Kona, you would be taking a very big risk. And perhaps we're not. She is over a hundred feet in the air. What if she isn't, Gwendolyn? Kona stopped pacing and looked at the crowd. What if her tree is one of those that came down? Gwendolyn shook her head sadly. If it was, then I very much doubt, dear, that Stumpy is such a fall. The old crab looked at the dog and spoke gently. Her chances of surviving seem to be very unlikely. Kona took a deep breath and, with eyes wide and sincere, answered, Whether she is alive or not, Gwendolyn, I have to take care of her. The crab sighed. <sighs> well, my dear, I expect you do, but I'm not sure how you will accomplish it. Five minutes later, Gwendolyn was working the lock on Professor Albert's front door. It's handy to have a hermit crab around when you want to pick a lock. Kona had held her steadily in his mouth, and with a deft claw, she turned the mechanism gently, gently, then click, it was done. Kona placed her back in her bowl. Thank you for not sneezing, dear, she said. I'm still not sure if I can get the door open, said Kona. Just pretend the knob is a bone, Gwendolyn answered. I have every confidence you will do it. And the dog did. After only a minute or so of vigorous gnawing and biting, the door popped open. Kona looked back at his good friend, staring anxiously through the glass, at Professor Albert snoring peacefully on the sofa, at his own warm bed in the corner and at the inviting flames of the fireplace. <sighs> Be back soon, Gwendolyn. Of course she was, said the crowd. Take good care, dear. She did not want Kona to know how worried she was. When Kona went out the front door, he didn't close it all the way behind him. He needed to be able to get back into the house before Professor Albert woke again. Kona breathed deeply, took one strong, confident step, and with a magnificent slide, shot right off Professor Albert's porch into the top of the juniper bush. Sprawled there, he groaned and looked at the several blocks he would have to cross to reach Gooseberry Park. He looked back at Gwendolyn in the window, her antenna swirling around and around. Just then, a heavy branch from a tree across the street crashed into his neighbor's front yard, taking several several broken shingles with it. Can't reach it. Kona sighed, then carefully maneuvered back onto his feet. Inching his way slowly, he began his icy journey. Gooseberry Park seemed to him to be on the other side of the world. Instead of taking the sidewalk, Kona decided to cut through yards. It would save time and there'd be more things to hold on to. He crossed one yard by hanging on to a hemlock hedge. Second yard had a rail fence he steadied himself against. In another, a large concrete planter kept him on his feet. Some yards had nothing at all to hold on to except the occasional ice-covered bush. In these yards, Kona danced, skated, skied, and rolled. He fell again and again, and once he struck his nose so hard that it bled. Kona saw not one sign of life along the way.
save for a very large yellow tomcat who tried to impress him by strolling easily across the icy top of an old Oldsmobile. Kona gave him a sour look and went on. The dog's body was bruised and his spirits were taken to beating as well, but he was determined. He knew where to find Stumpy's tree and he was bound to make it there. Something inside him was telling him to do this. His teeth ached from holding on to every solid object he could grasp and his tongue was numb with the cold. But something calls him and no matter the price, he would answer. All right, we're also going to read a second chapter today. It's chapter nine, Rescue and Remorse. When he finally reached Dumpy's pin oak tree, Kona was stunned by what he saw. The top of the tree had been snapped off, snapped off like a beam. What was left over its lower trunk still stood sharp and upright, ice hanging down its side like a fresh cut wound. So this is Dumpy's tree. Doesn't look good for Stumpy. Scattered across the ground lay the debris that had once given the giant oak its majesty. Solid pieces of trunk mammoth branches with long graceful stems hundreds of broken twigs all glistening under a hard layer of ice kona could barely breathe for a moment he simply closed his eyes then he whispered Stumpy. his voice was lost in the desolation of the park he cleared his throat and this time spoke louder stumpy clamping his teeth onto the scattered branches to steady himself he made his way around what was left of the tree every few feet he called out Stumpy, and each time he was met by sound. And when he found a part of Stumpy's nest scattered on the ground, bits of bright material and gum wrappers thrown everywhere, it was almost more than he could bear. He sat down and hung his head. Look at that tree. Stopped there, motionless, discouraged, confused, and very cold, Kona heard a sound. It was a sound like a song. He lifted his ear. The sound was coming from within a large piece of broken trunk that had rolled away from the rest of the debris and settled against a broad rhododendron bush. Kona stood up and listened more intently. rock a bye bottom in the treetop, someone sang. Ha ha, get it? Stomp? Kona's voice boomed across the wreckage. Stomp? The dog leaped forward, then danced like a Bolshevik until he landed beside the singing tree trunk flat on his back. He moaned. From a small round hole in the trunk, a little black-headed fuzz with silver poked out, and it looked at Kona. Help! the head shouted. Kona raised himself up and moved closer. The little black head that had yelped for help belonged to a bat. Murray? he inquired. In person, answered the bat. Are you all right? Kona asked. I think we bounced, said Murray. You must be Kona. I knew somebody would find you. The kids are all in here snoring like elephants. Stumpy didn't find me, said Kona. I came on my own. You did? asked Murray. Stumpy's not with you? No, said Kona. Well, she's not with me, wailed Murray. She said she'd go get you. Where is she? the two said together. Kona's heart sank. He looked all around the deathly quiet park. Stump, he called. Stump. Oh, whoa, said Murray, shaking his head. She said she'd find you and you could help us. Now she's disappeared. Oh, whoa. One of the babies inside the hole began to cry. Another sneeze. These kids are freezing, said Murray. He went back inside the hole to wrap them up in his wings. Kona was torn. He had to look for Stumpy, but where had she gone? She had never been to his house, so how did you think she would find him? The fall must have rattled her senses. Kona wanted to keep looking for her, but the babies needed shelter, and quickly. It would be very dangerous for them to be exposed to the cold much longer. Kona made his decision. He spoke into the hole. We have to get you to my house, Murray, you and the babies. Then I'll come back to search for Stumpy. Me and the babies? Murray said from within. Me? I'll be okay. Well, I can't get them out of here alone, said Kona. Can't you call a cab or something? Kona was thinking hard. I've got it, he said. You can all ride on my back. Excuse me, said Murray. He popped his head out of the hole again. It's the only way, Kona insisted. You can sit on my back and tuck the children inside your wings. It'll be like riding a horse. Sure, like I've ever ridden a horse, answered Murray. We're going to end up on hard copy. I know it. But within minutes, Murray was on Kona's back, humming nervously. The babies tucked under his wings. 
Now that Kona had to carry everyone, he was really worried. He had fallen dozens of times on his way to the park, but he couldn't risk any such accidents on the journey home. There was only one thing to do. What? Murray called out. We're crawling? We're gonna crawl? Gee, maybe we'll get there by September. We'll make it, said Kona. Just hold tight to those babies. Ouch, Murray yelled. Ouch! Does a Stumpy ever feed these kids? It took Kona an hour and a half to make what was usually a ten-minute walk to his house. It was a good thing he was a Labrador retriever. Labradors can withstand very cold temperatures and great pain. And only a dog like Kona could have made... Oh, sorry, guys, my pages are stuck. Ah! Could have made the grueling journey home. In the moonlight of the clearing sky, everything glittered like diamonds, as if all the world had become a jewel. And even as Kona pulled himself across the yards, he was moved and strengthened by the incredible beauty all around him. He might even have forgotten that the others were there with him had not Murray yelled, Giddy up, every five minutes. I love Murray. When Kona finally saw Professor Albert's house again and saw that the front door was still slightly ajar and that the fireplace still glowed and that he was home, he wanted to weep. It was as if he were gazing at heaven itself. When Kona turned into the yard, Murray knew too that they had arrived. Yippee, he yelled. Kona struggled up the icy steps, then cautiously put his head inside the door. Professor Albert still lay snoring on the sofa. Welcome back, dear, Gwendolyn said softly. Kona walked into the room and gently lay down on the floor. Mooey, Mooey, sorry guys, Murray scooped the babies up and hopped off. Easy features make mistakes. Wow, said Murray, look at the size of that television. Did I tell you I love Jeopardy? Gwendolyn smiled at Kona. A remarkable dog, she said. All right, so tomorrow we will read chapter 10, The Wanderer. All right, so what's going to happen with Murray, the babies, Kona, and Gwendolyn, all at Professor Albert's house. I have a feeling it's not going to go without its problems. I will see you guys tomorrow.